Okay, Carl, show us some of that grumpy look. No, no, I'm kidding. Yeah, let's go. Come on, Carl. You can do it. Yes, don't you dare talk to me. I'm an Aryan Übermensch, too obsessed with the image of myself to be involved with anyone or anything that doesn't fit my stylized image of the world. Wait. Suddenly I'm dressed in something way less expensive. It's H&M. Everybody come together. You can too be a part of this happy smiling group of mixed skin colors for not that much money. Hashtag friendship, hashtag everyone's equal, hashtag happy life, hashtag stop climate change. Oh no. I am so sorry, darling. I didn't see that it was Balenciaga you're wearing. We are strong and tough and unapproachable. Show me that Balenciaga look. Oh, I'm sorry. I think it's back to H&M again. Yay! We're just kidding. We're so cheap. We're so happy. Yes. Everybody come closer together. Balenciaga's back. Ooh, fiercer than ever. We are stone cold. Yes. Oh my God, get away from us. Balenciaga is one of the world's most famous luxury fashion brands. Known for its hefty price tags, cutting edge designs, and disruptive avant-garde approach. The brand dominated celebrity culture, runways, and the future of fashion as a whole, until news flooded the internet of Balenciaga's own publication depicting satanic imagery and alluding to child exploitation in various design campaigns. Is there a cabal of elites who operate under the caring umbrella to manipulate people into buying the devil's drip? or? Is this just a quick story pushed by reactionary news sources, networks, and social media? The answer is somewhere in the middle. There is no good and evil. There is only Balenciaga, and those too weak to seek it. To understand fashion, you must familiarize yourself with its three tiers. Mass market, where inexpensive materials are compiled to create affordable designs for a broad range of customers. Think Target, Walmart, and even Amazon. Pret-a-porter, or ready-to-wear, which is self-explanatory pre-manufactured clothing that sold finished like a pair of jeans from the mall. And the most infamous and least obtainable, haute couture, or high dressmaking in French, combines the basic ingredients of fashion, silhouette, proportions, color, texture, layering, among others, to conceive something never before seen and perfectly fitted. Technically speaking, haute couture clothing must adhere to certain guidelines in order for it to qualify for this label. However, the term has been used by elite fashion houses to describe their clothing as a step above competition. Fashion houses such as Dior, Chanel, Givenchy, Saint Laurent, and Balenciaga all have one thing in common. Their clothing is seen as more than just an expensive trend. It's seen as art. Whether you agree with this or not, it doesn't matter you're not their audience. There's an inherent classism in high fashion because the barrier to entry is absurd. They simply don't charge what it costs to make, they charge what people are willing to pay. Luxury brands often spend more on packaging, rent, marketing, shipping, designing, and research because diminishing returns between quality and price already exist. If done right, every detail from the start of production to the finished piece is accounted for and done with purpose. Some even argue that high fashion is less controversial than fast fashion due to the fact that affordable clothing is oftentimes mass produced, sometimes through cheap or even slave labor, while high fashion is regulated, uses higher quality materials, and is designed by expert craftsmen. Or maybe that's just what they want consumers to believe. A vast majority of the world uses clothing strictly as utility, to cover themselves, to keep warm. Most people don't care about style beyond fitting in or following the status quo. High fashion comes with a privilege and can play on one's need to be part of a group or deviate from it entirely. Then you have companies like Zara, the number one enemy of high fashion, who relentlessly steal silhouettes and use cheap materials to earn insane profits. It should be noted that expensive brands are not above this either. Stealing designs is just a problem that will most likely never get solved. In some way, high fashion will always be different from fast fashion because it invokes some sort of feeling, giving meaning to a consumer, or at least that's what they often strive for. Sometimes the artistry gets lost in translation, and high fashion brands stretch the absurd themes for the sole purpose of being different or original. And if you have to try this hard to be different, 
Are you even any different at all? This mentality ended up leaving Balenciaga, its parent company Kering, as well as anyone else involved in the brand with a ton of questions from the public that they couldn't answer. Their response? Half-baked apologies and a hard reset. Whether the accusations are true or not, there is plenty of information floating around the internet that, once pieced together, provides a sufficient explanation. Balenciaga's origins began with one man, Cristobal Balenciaga as a guere, the king of fashion. At the age of 12, in 1907, Cristobal was an apprentice for a tailor until the foremost noblewoman in his town, the Marchioness de Casatores, became his client. She saw Cristobal's raw talent and decided to send him to Madrid to be formally trained as a couturier. Cristobal earned rapid success for being one of the few couturiers who could redefine silhouettes and use their own hands to pattern, cut, and sew any design imagined. In 1918, at the age of 23, Cristobal opened his first boutique in San Sebastián, Spain. His brand quickly branched off to Madrid and Barcelona, where Spanish aristocracy began to wear his designs. After the onset of the Spanish Civil War, Cristobal was forced to close down his boutiques and move to Paris. As much as he may have missed his homeland, France provided Cristobal with opportunities in fashion that he could not resist. His genius was truly admired in post-war Europe through silhouettes, high-waisted dresses, and coat cuts until 1968, at the age of 74, when he decided to retire and close his fashion houses. Cristobal Balenciaga would pass away four years later in Xabia, Spain, with a reputation from other designers as, quote, the master of us all, and, quote, the only couturier in the truest sense of the word. Sadly, it appeared as if the Balenciaga name would die alongside its founder. The brand was reignited in 1986 when Jacques Conquier of Jacques Bogart bought the Balenciaga company. Under new management, the Balenciaga name actively kept up with the latest fashion trends, with the brand's products and accessories being highly sought after by consumers. In 2001, Balenciaga would be bought again by the Gucci Group under the management of Pinot Priton Redu, or or PPR for an undisclosed sum. PPR had started as a timber trading company in France, but at some point transitioned to luxury goods by acquiring companies such as Bottega Veneta, Gucci, Alexander McQueen, and Yves Saint Laurent. PPR, a now multinational conglomerate named Kering, saw promise in the Balenciaga name, setting it on a path of success that was only recently stifled. With their creative director being known for his provocative trolling and statements with his clothing, the brand is constantly at the forefront of pop culture. Balenciaga was sure to make new waves in modern fashion. By pushing the boundaries of avant-garde clothing and an understanding of meme culture mixed with performance art, but it was only a matter of time something sinister would wash up. Bringing the latest in contemporary fashion with form and technique, this new house of Balenciaga had solidified a name for itself among the elite as Cristobal once did, claiming to deliver, quote, unprecedented interactions with the expanding digital realm, material developments, and today's social responsibilities, in the hopes of staying at the forefront of modernity. If you have ever-increasing original ideas and designs, there is bound to be criticism and pushback, yet a revolutionary or unique product or trend was not Balenciaga's problem. In one of the luxury house's latest campaigns, published on November 16th, 2022, titled Balenciaga Gift Shop, children were pictured holding teddy bear handbags, wearing supposed BDSM gear. The children can also be seen in questionable poses and amid wine glasses, which social media ran with as child exploitation or endangerment. This collection was captured by famous photographer Gabriel Gallimberti, whose most notable collection, Toy Stories, resembled the style used in the Balenciaga campaign. According to media sources, Gallimberti was told by Balenciaga representatives to use his Toy Stories approach, but they would provide the punk items. Besides child exploitation, as if that wasn't damning enough, Balenciaga's campaigns were thought to contain satanic imagery. Through evidence such as a child's drawing with what looks like to be the devil, a black hoodie, 
neatly placed, resembling cult attire, as well as the most compelling clue, a roll of yellow Balenciaga tape depicting two A's, which spells Ball. Ball was an ancient word used in the Levant to describe an owner or lord, but in its more modern iteration, it has become the name of a pagan god, synonymous with child sacrifice. Some people even go as far as to say Google Translate reinforces the satanic controversy. Using Latin to English, typing Ball NC Aga into the search bar gives you Ball is King, but this is where the conspiracy theory starts to run into some problems. The actual word for king in Latin is rex, and you can experiment with Latin to English and come up with similar odd results. There is also ba len si aga, which translates to do what you want. But does anyone believe Google Translate even remotely works, let alone for Latin? Try using Google Translate to have a conversation with someone who speaks a different language, and you will find out soon enough it falls apart. For example, if you type in stop hair loss, you get today's video is sponsored by Keeps. Keeps is a subscription service that helps men keep their hair. They offer clinically proven treatments that help combat the symptoms of hair loss. Best of all, all of Keeps treatment plans are personalized, tailored to fit your needs, and they ship right to your doorstep. You don't even have to leave your house. Two out of three guys will experience hair loss by the age of 35. But have no fear, Keeps has you covered. Keeps offers clinically proven, research-backed treatments that stop hair loss and improve hair growth. Every Keeps treatment plan comes with one year of unlimited messaging, so you can connect with your medical provider about anything anytime. In addition to clinically proven treatments, Keeps offers an award-winning, all-natural, thickening shampoo and conditioner system. You can also subscribe to Keeps and get refill reminders so you never run low on the products you need to take the best care of your hair. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get a special offer, go to keeps.com slash filion. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash filion. Or just click the link down below. And thank you to Keeps for sponsoring this video. Why would Satanists intercept Google Translate's code to make this message? Did Lucifer tell them to? And isn't Balenciaga the founder's middle name? A family name passed down for generations? Wait, was Cristobal's family Satanists? This would have to be the single greatest Satanic PSYOP, starting in 1895 and finally coming to fruition in 2023 with the fall of Google Translate. The sad reality is, you don't need a child murdering god if it's already confirmed that we live in a hellish society by the fact that Balenciaga's sincere apology was posted as an Instagram story. And at this point, the ultimate power move would have been to never apologize. But this is what they had to say. We sincerely apologize for any offense our holiday campaign may have caused. Our plush bear bags should not have been featured with children in this campaign. We have immediately removed the campaign from all platforms. It should be noted that Balenciaga is apologizing for depicting the bags with children, not the bags themselves. Oftentimes on social media, silence is immediately equated to guilt, and by the time they responded, the damage was already done. Balenciaga headquarters was in full crisis management mode, until another disaster struck. A campaign focused on an office theme, highlighting Balenciaga's guard robe line and a new era for the brand, was projected to launch in spring of 2023, which was in collaboration with Adidas. At first glance, nothing seemed out of the ordinary with this campaign, but the internet was hesitant to trust the multi-billion dollar company after their previous oversight. It should be noted that photography sets are controlled environments where everything on the scene is purposeful especially at this caliber. In what resembles a deliberate act by the studio and crews involved, Balenciaga's guard robe campaign included a photo with a page from a Supreme Court ruling of United States v. Williams. United States v. Williams was a ruling to prohibit the promotion or pandering of child pornography and that it was not in violation of the First Amendment. Essentially, 
Michael Williams was Chris Hansen in a chat room by Secret Service agent Timothy Devine, who posed as Lisa and Miami. After receiving images of minors engaging in sexually explicit conduct, the Secret Service executed a search warrant of Williams' home, seizing more images of underage children. Why would Balenciaga purposely place this in one of their campaigns? What were they trying to insinuate? In the background of an image from the same campaign, observant viewers found more features. A pair of strange art books, Matthew Barney's The Cremaster Cycle, and Michael Borman's As Sweet As It Gets. The first book describes visuals from Barney's five-part film series of the same name. The films were created purposefully out of order because Matt Barney, quite frankly, doesn't give a shit. The man makes five experimental movies with little to no dialogue, ends up being hailed the most important American artist of his generation by the New York Times, and refuses to elaborate. However, there are two sides of the aisle. One side believes the films are bizarre, filled with nightmarish creatures and obscure sexual references, while others believe it to be an utter masterpiece. Why don't you decide? There's certainly overlap between Balenciaga and the Cremaster Cycle. Both play with avant-garde fashion, as well as strange environments, to convey a sense of outlandish futurism, not too far off from one of their runways. The second book, published in 2014, combines more than 100 pieces produced by Michael Bormans over a total of 14 years, including maybe his most infamous work, Fire from the Sun, which depicts unsettling images of maimed children covered in blood, with ominous implications of violence and other disturbing images. Imagery. To some, it's reminiscent of Lord of the Flies and the Loss of Innocence. To others, it's the most disgusting excuse for art they've ever seen. But art is subjective, and there are probably dozens of people ready to line up and gaze upon Borman's mutilated toddlers. Regardless if you like Borman's art, he's an established European artist who illustrates whatever he wants, and his artwork is displayed in museums across the globe. One thing is for sure, not everyone wants to be associated with him. Gabriele Gallimberti even had to clarify that the campaign featuring the Supreme Court document and Borman's alarming literature was not photographed by him, stating, Following the hundreds of hate mails and messages I received as a result of the photos I took for the Balenciaga campaign, I feel compelled to make this statement. I am not in a position to comment on Balenciaga's choices, but I must stress that I was not entitled in whatsoever manner to neither choose the products nor the models nor the combination of the same. As a photographer, I was only and solely requested to light the given scene and take shots according to my signature style. As usual for a commercial shooting, the direction of the campaign and the choice of the objects displayed are not in the hands of the photographer. I suspect that any person prone to pedophilia searches on the web and has unfortunately a too easy access to images completely different than mine, absolutely explicit in their awful content. Lynchings like these are addressed against wrong targets and to distract from the real problem and criminals. Also, I have no connection with the photo where a Supreme Court document appears. That one was taken in another set by other people and was falsely associated with my photos. Gabrielle was being unfairly lumped into the second campaign while social media, Twitter mainly, was trigger-happy with their allegations. He had faced enough criticism. Balenciaga's apology for the guard rope line was pretty much identical to their first apology, except they did partner with the National Children's Alliance in hopes of restoring some decency. We apologize for displaying unsettling documents in our campaign. Balenciaga added, we take this matter very seriously and are taking legal action against the parties responsible for creating this set and including unapproved items for our spring 23 campaign photo shoot. 
We strongly condemn abuse of children in any form. We stand for children's safety and well-being. But a simple apology would not suffice. Everyone was out for blood. Balenciaga officials announced the beginning of a $25 million lawsuit against North Six, the production company that built the Guard Rope campaign, and Nicolas Desjarda, the set designer. What people may not know is that Balenciaga promptly dropped this lawsuit and has decided not to pursue any legal discourse. There are three potential reasons as to why they would do this. It was a complete accident and the documents were rented from props used in movies and television. Balenciaga knew about the documents, went through with the campaign, and weren't obliged to say anything until heavily criticized. Or there's no such thing as bad publicity. Something tells me that associating in the same stratosphere as CP would have to be the dumbest marketing move ever. It's simply inconceivable, but you can draw your own conclusions. Kim Kardashian, Balenciaga's biggest collaborator and celebrity endorsement spoke out about the controversy, stating that she would be reevaluating her relationship with the brand. Naturally, Balenciaga got seriously worried, so they decided to apologize again. In a now deleted Instagram post, Balenciaga addressed the issues raised by its advertising campaigns. The company repeated that it deplores child abuse and that it was, quote, never our intent to include it in our narrative. Cristobal may have never been around for the public to cast blame. Nonetheless, the online mob did decide to berate a single man. On September 13th, 2021, in typical Kardashian fashion, all of the attention at the Met Gala was on Kim. The dress code theme was American independence, yet she was completely covered and murdered out next to another shadowy figure, Demna Vasalia. Demna is Balenciaga's creative director and co-founder of Vetement, who was blamed for allowing these campaign mistakes to slip through. He only apologized to the public once the business of fashion, a lead authority in the industry, revoked him as recipient of their Global Voices Award for 2022. To this day, Demna is attacked on social media for his involvement with Balenciaga's controversy. In an interview with Vogue, Demna tried to clarify that the teddy bear bags were in reference to punk and DIY culture. Absolutely not BDSM. Quote, I didn't realize how inappropriate it would be to put these objects in the image and still have the kid in the middle. It unfortunately was the wrong idea and a bad decision from me. One theory that is not out of the question, is that Demna knew associating children, which are conventionally portrayed with innocence, next to the dark aesthetics of evil, would be sure to cause commotion. However, this slippery slope of association led people to connect everything in proximity to it whether it made sense or not. Either way, Demna apologized. So it's only right that internet detectives would move on to more individuals to barrage, whether they were guilty or not. Online theories surrounding Balenciaga spawned from Reddit, Twitter, and 4chan gained a ton of attention, but mistakenly provided incorrect information regarding a renowned model and stylist, Lada Valkova. Lada was a former stylist for Balenciaga and co-founder of the famous 2014 streetwear collective Vetma, beside Demna Vasalia and Gosha Robchinsky. She was heavily criticized for the BDSM-themed teddy bears and Supreme Court ruling prop to the point she had to condemn the abuse of children in any form. Lada was also thought to be the model pictured here, carrying two blood-soaked dolls during a runway shoot. This photo in particular circulated online, riling up more people, but was later disproved. The real model is unnamed, and the photo itself was verified to be from 2016 China Fashion Week. To further prove her innocence, Lada has claimed to not have worked with Balenciaga or its team since 2017. This did not stop Jake Shields, a former UFC fighter, from posting her occult-themed artwork on Twitter. Since Shields had the wrong identity of Lada to begin with, it's possible the photos he obtained from her Instagram are fake. But it's also conceivable that she's deleted any possible images that could incriminate her. Though edgy artists exist and the internet seems to forget that. Lada's dark shit posting 
is just her aesthetic. However, the biggest worry for her detractors were the photos including children, social media posts with blood, as well as her relationship with the third and final co-founder of Vetma, Gosha Rubchinsky. In 2018, Gosha was accused of pressuring a 16-year-old model into sending him explicit pictures. He denied the claims and said that the messages were manipulated in order to make him malicious and that he was just asking for pictures for a particular runway shoot. Nothing has come of these allegations since. It may be true that Lada and or Gosha influenced Balenciaga's decisions when they work there, but shouldn't be to blame for incidents that happened years later. Artists like Lada love shock value whether they know it or not, oftentimes forming a niche audience that appreciates their work. Additionally, fringe artists revel in the idea of people being mad at them for something as surface level as provocative social media posts. What may be satanic and horrifying to some, just goes hard for others. When this artistry or provocation bleeds into traditional, naive channels of information, they're met with torches and pitchforks. But this is not the first time a worldwide fashion brand has been accused of child exploitation. If you grew up during the 80s and 90s, the allegations surrounding Calvin Klein can be seen as eerily familiar. In 1980, Calvin Klein decided he needed a new model with a modern spirit to be the face of his upcoming Calvin Klein gene campaign. Calvin's interests led him to choose 15-year-old Brooke Shields. The secret of life lies hidden in a genetic code. Genes are fundamental in determining the characteristics of an individual and passing on these characteristics to succeeding generations. Occasionally, certain conditions produce a structural change in the gene, which will bring about the process of evolution. This may occur in one or more of the following ways. Firstly, by selective mating, in which a single gene type proves superior in transmitting its genes to future generations. Secondly, by gene drift, in which certain genes may fade away while other genes persist. And finally, by natural selection, which filters out those genes better equipped than others to endure in the environment. This may result in the origin of an entirely new species, which brings us to Calvin's and the survival of the fittest. Calvin Klein genes. Predictably, a lot of people took issue with the sexualization of a 15-year-old, but Brooke claims that there were no problems and that Calvin treated her well on set. Nowadays, looking back on the situation, Brooke covers the controversy stating, quote, I can understand it now, where it's coming from, but for some reason, and maybe it's just protection, I'm not mad at it. It afforded me a lot. After all, she says, quote, sex sells. Sex has been selling since the dawn of time, and it still does. This statement highlights that she's aware that she's been sexualized underage, because she was compensated and her career took off. I guess, depending on how much money you're paid, you can be groomed into believing it was par for the course. Brooke Shields wasn't the only con controversial choice made by Calvin Klein back in the day. Twelve years after her campaign with Calvin Klein, Kate Moss and Mark Wahlberg were pictured in an infamous advertisement. The controversy began due to the fact Kate was 17 at the time, posing topless on top of the 21-year-old Wahlberg. Now that could definitely come between me and my Calvins. Do you have Calvin Klein underwear on? Identifying her actual age on the internet is a bit murky, as some sources say 17, others say 18. However, Kate Moss herself said she experienced a nervous break at 17 or 18 when she had to participate in these shoots. And this predatory environment was not new to her, as she had been asked to remove her bra at the age of 15 during a separate photo shoot. By far the most chilling campaign made by Calvin Klein was in 1995. You look like a movie star. Yes, I am. You are? Yes. Where are you from? I'm from Italy. I'm from Roma. Uh-huh. So you've made films already? Sorry? Have you made films already? Yes. Uh-huh. Have you made love in film? Uh, what? Have you ever made love in a film? Yes. You have? I'm an actress. Oh, yeah. Smile. 
That's my way to my eyes. I prefer. Now turn around and walk towards the wall again. And now, when you get to the wall, just, there you go. And give me a smile. Good. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm shy. <laughs> I prefer to die this moment. <laughs> you got a real nice look. How old are you? 21. What's your name? August. Why don't you stand up? Are you strong? I'd like to think so. You think you could rip that shirt off of you? It's a nice body. Do you work out? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can tell. This campaign, shot by Steven Meisel, became one of the most controversial in the brand's history. The ads featured some underage models in what seemed like a wood-paneled basement, and there are still relics from these commercials online today. Can you unbutton the top button of those jeans? No. Why don't you push them down a little bit? No. I don't think so. Are you nervous? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because I'm on the spot. <laughs> You've been on the spot before. Not like this. It's <laughs> <laughs> torture. <laughs> For the most part, you just get the feeling that you're watching Patrick Bateman's videotapes. Thousands of people, including parent groups, child welfare authorities, and the American Family Association, agreed that these ads were exploitative in nature and borderline CP. The president at the time, Bill Clinton, as well as his wife Hillary, were at a re-election dinner when Bill decided to talk about, quote, the explosion of crime among juveniles. He added, quote, I may be stepping on somebody's toe tonight. I don't have any comment on whether those Calvin Klein ads were legal or illegal, but those children were my daughter's age in those ads, and they were outrageous. It was wrong. It was wrong to manipulate those children and use them for commercial benefit. It's hard enough to grow up as it is without confusing people further. Settle down, Bill. I got this. One dinner had launched an entire investigation into Calvin Klein by the Justice Department to find if any advertisements broke pornography laws. Their summary concluded Calvin Klein had used several minors in the ad campaign, but photographs or videos of them did not display the, quote, genital and pubic areas, as federal law requires in order to prove the sexual exploitation of children. Eventually, the investigation was dropped altogether, as Calvin Klein was able to prove the models pictured in risque photos were of age, while underage models were not depicted sexually. They still pulled every ad in the hopes of regaining some of their popularity, which saved them. This controversy blew over and didn't really matter in the long run. Calvin Klein is now worth around $800 million. So if anything, consumers just heard the name more and bought the jeans. Perhaps Balenciaga wanted to further experiment with shock value and knew that it would be successful in attracting more consumers over an extended period of time. It may have backfired initially, but they'll come back. They weren't the first fashion company to come under fire, and they won't be the last. Balenciaga will continue pushing boundaries of fashion to satisfy an artistic need, almost as if to usher in a new age of performance art. Contemporary fashion houses, including Balenciaga, have moved to incorporate crazy settings into their design philosophy. If the clothes or set doesn't speak to you, if they don't have a hidden theme, then they're doing something wrong. Whether it's the back rooms, a rented out parking garage, a mountain of graffiti, an epileptic's worst nightmare, a strobe light rave, or an actual parking garage. And lastly, for spring and summer in 2023, Balenciaga paid a Spanish artist to design a mud runway for their show. Demna explained in a statement before the event that, quote, the set of this show is a metaphor for digging for truth and being down to earth. Apart from the futuristic performance art, eccentric settings, and canceled celebrities, amid all of this, Balenciaga's controversy drew the internet's attention to two indiscriminate artists. Jake and Dinos Chapman. 
Jake and Dinos are British visual artists who deliberately create shocking imagery that tend to land them in trouble from time to time. The Chapmans were linked to Balenciaga through a corporate family tree. It begins with Francois Henry Penault, the CEO of Kering. Besides Balenciaga, Kering also owns a company called Group Artemis, which is the parent company of Christie's. Christie's is an art auction house where you can browse the world's finest art. And if you browse long enough, you may stumble upon Jake and Dino's disturbing art. There's Fuckface, the Zygotic, the Four-Headed Cockroach Kid, Forehead, Platinum Joey, Two-Faced Cunt, or maybe you wanted Fuckface in bronze, Doggy, there's no hearing anyone out, this should be illegal. There's plenty more unsettling art made by Jake and Dinos, but I wouldn't waste your time looking at it. You'll probably end up on an FBI watch list if you aren't already. It's clear the brothers don't care about criticism. In fact, it's probably central to their art anyway. They do what they love, and that includes sexualizing children and creating miniature models of CP. If Jeffrey Epstein needed a paperweight for his desk, this is probably where he would shop. After all, it's not like billionaire Henry Penault is personally involved with each item and artist among his affiliate marketplaces and businesses. He doesn't have time to do this because he's too busy sacrificing a child to ball. If we're to be realists about this, the subjective nature of art will never change. What's shocking sells, and often time for these pretentious artists, they feed off pissing you off. The issue, or inherent beauty of art, is that there is no distinct line in the sand of what is too far, and you'll have artists die to protect it. Balenciaga's cancellation was the product of edgy art gone too far, corporate oversight, and a social media witch hunt. When the flow of information is dictated by the 24-hour news cycle, you'll have outlets pump out reactionary garbage in order to run with the story, because they have to. Social media impressions are then farmed by attention-hungry users that want the world to be more evil than it actually is. It's all too normal and convenient to take a story and spin it so that it fits an agenda, only to push a narrative of predictable tropes. In a digital era where information is monetizable, it shouldn't be surprising when emotionally charged stories are milked for everything that they are. The answers are always more complex. I simply can't stand it. And if you want to support the antithesis of this, consider signing up to the Third Eye Global Patreon. You'll get exclusive access to our Discord and member-only content. The link is down below. Balenciaga's statements toward their controversial campaigns were met with deaf ears, as most of social media still criticizes them for what they did. But as we saw with Calvin Klein, it takes more than just some strangely artistic campaigns to take down a multi-billion dollar company. Balenciaga will always be Kering's prodigal son, profiting from collaborations with the biggest of celebrities and models. With leadership under Demna, who has been quoted in a recent interview as not being worried about the controversy, only the heads of Balenciaga, such as Demna, know if all of it was a deliberate ploy or a genuine error in judgment. But despite the ethics and morals behind it all, the uproar that shock value provides will never cease to be fashionable. Demna, who has a genius level understanding of mimetic culture, is responsible for propelling Balenciaga into the stratosphere. And something tells me he's not quite done with the brand yet. Balenciaga!